this is going to be another question and answer video and a really good question that I got in an email says is it possible for a Christian to sell their soul or is it possible for a Christian to be involved in witchcraft after they're saved well the and the quick answer to the first question is no it's not possible for a Christian to sell their soul However, there is no fun in a quick answer, and a quick answer hardly ever answers the question to where the person who asked the question can understand why that's the answer. So I just don't like to give, you know, really quick answers. That's why sometimes the answers may take me a little bit longer. But here's why a Christian cannot sell their soul. It's because the moment you got born again, your soul is no longer connected to your flesh. Therefore, any decision that you make in the flesh doesn't have any effect on your soul. It is secure in Jesus Christ. And this is the greatest doctrine to teach eternal security is the spiritual circumcision. The greatest doctrine to teach eternal security. And it's in Colossians 2, verse 10 through 13. It says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, and whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So what it's saying is, the moment you got born again, the Lord performed an operation on you. He cut your soul loose from your flesh. Now anytime you mess up in sin, that sin does not get applied to the soul like it did before you were saved. See, before you were saved and you sinned, your flesh and your soul were stuck together. So anytime you sinned, those sins went to the soul. Now, after you got saved, your soul is made spotless and clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. God cut the soul loose from the flesh. They're no longer connected. Therefore, God sees you as righteous as Jesus Christ because you've been washed in the blood. So if a professing Christian claims that they were once a Christian and then sold their soul, they just haven't been informed on this very precious Bible truth of the spiritual circumcision. Also, not everyone who says they are a Christian is actually a Christian. They are, there are many professors that aren't possessors. There's people that uh, claim to have sold their soul, like Katy Perry. You know, she started out as a supposed Christian artist, and then she claims she sold her soul to the devil. If there was ever a time when she truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ to be a crucified, bread, and risen Savior, then she's saved. No matter what she's done in her flesh, no matter what type of contract she signed, she would still be a Christian. But the only thing is, is she really a Christian? We don't know. I mean, I kind of doubt it. I mean, I don't like to look at people's uh, works and things like that to judge their salvation. But, I mean, she, I don't even know if she still professes to be a Christian. I mean, I don't know her heart. I don't know. I don't like to guess on that. But there's many people that claim that they've sold their soul, that used to be a Christian. Most likely, they aren't. But that doesn't mean they can't be. Because as you've seen, your soul is not stuck to your flesh. So therefore, what you do in the flesh does not mess up your soul. It's secure in Jesus Christ. If you truly were born again if you truly saved. So a Christian can't sell their soul to the devil, but they can sell their flesh to the devil. A Christian can sell their flesh to the devil. Each and every time you make a decision to do something sinful, you please the devil and you displease God. And there are Christians who completely give themselves over to satisfying the flesh. They, in a sense, have sold their flesh out to the world and the devil. If Katy Perry truly got born again, way back when she was younger, she certainly has sold her flesh to the devil to work evil in the sight of the Lord. 
In 2 Timothy 4.10, it says, For Demas, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So Demas sold out, sold his flesh, but he didn't sell his soul. He's a Christian. He couldn't sell his soul. Romans 6, 11 through 14 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. See, you can sell your flesh to the devil. You can allow sin to reign in your mortal body. So Paul says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and, are mem mem and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So you, you can make your body fulfill the desires that it wants instead of yielding to God and doing what the Holy Spirit wants. You can sell your flesh out. The fact that Paul wrote what he wrote in Romans 6 proves that a Christian can yield themselves, their members, as instruments of unrighteousness. For a Christian to get off deep into sin, he can be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, not the soul. So you can sell your flesh to the devil. And that's why the man in 1 Corinthians 5, 5 says to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, not the soul, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So it's in the flesh. It's the flesh that you can sell, not the soul. It is the flesh that can come into possession of the devil and not the soul. Many times you hear Bible believers talk about a, that Christians can be demon-possessed. And people get all bent out of shape on that. But what people don't realize is they're refer referring to the flesh going into possession of the devil, not the soul. The devil can't possess your soul. He can get your flesh. So Paul says in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. See, they go against each other, your flesh and your spirit. You have two natures. Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We should walk in newness of life. We don't need to sell our flesh out to the devil to get fame, fortune, money, or whatever else. Now this leads me into some answering some other questions by different people. There are other consequences to not living a godly life. One is not getting a full reward. I got a question about what is a full reward. Well, someone who sells out, sells their flesh to the devil is not going to get a full reward, obviously. But in the context in 2 John, where he talks about a full reward, I'm going to show you what that's talking about exactly. So look at 2 John Verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. In the context, someone not getting a full reward has to do with a believer who starts uh, bidding a deceiver or an antichrist God's speed and therefore becomes partaker of his evil deeds. For example, example, the common illustration for this is when a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, a Jehovah's Witness denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He denies that Jesus Christ is God. If you bid him God's speed, you become partaker of his evil deeds, and you lose a full reward for going along with damnable false doctrine that he's teaching. Or, for example, a Bible preacher can sell out to the flesh 
He can sell his flesh to the world and the devil and start shacking up with uh, false teachers so that he gets more popularity. He can get more meetings. This happens many times. I recently seen a, a fundamental King James Bible-believing Baptist, supposedly, and he was in an interview with some people talking about it's good to get the Pentecostals together and all these other you know, false uh, cults. And this, he's going to lose it. If he gets, if he just keeps on, he's going to lose his full reward. You do not want to um, join up with false teachers and false uh, Christians who are teaching f uh, false gospels. This is going to cause you to lose a full reward. You don't want to be around people that are saying that Jesus was just a good man and not actually Jesus Christ and not actually God manifest in the flesh. You don't want to be around those people. You want to witness to those people, try to show them what the Bible actually says, but when it comes to fellowshipping with these people and trying to get spiritually fed from those type of people, those are the people you want to stay away from. You don't want to say, God bless you to them. You don't want to say, I'm praying for your ministry. I mean, they have a ministry from the devil if they're saying that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh. If they're saying that Jesus Christ is not God manifested in the flesh, then they have damnable doctrine because we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe Jesus Christ is God. And anyone who makes Jesus Christ not God, they're saying that he's a sinner just like me and you. So we want to stay away from those people. That's how you're not going to get a full reward. And there are plenty of really saved people, preachers, who sell out their flesh to the devil in the sense they're trying to get maybe more money, more popularity, more meetings by kind of shacking up with deceivers. Because there's more deceivers than there are actually Bible believers. So the more you get away from the Bible believing way of doing things, the more popular you're going to get. So for a Christian to support or act like it's okay to join up with men teaching damnable heresies such as Jesus not being God, you can lose rewards this way. That's what the full reward in the context is talking about. You can cause yourself to not get a full reward by doing that. The greatest example everyone uses many times will be Billy Graham, who he may have won a lot of souls to Jesus Christ, but he really started getting with people that were teaching the damnable heresies. And when I say damnable heresies, I'm not talking about... Um, when you believe the rapture is going to happen, saying the uh, post-tribulation rapture, that's not a damnable heresy. I'm talking about stuff like j saying Jesus is not God. I'm talking about stuff like saying water baptism is necessary for salvation. Things like that. That's how you're going to lose a full reward. I mean, you don't want to swap pulpits with a Church of Christ pastor and have him come to your church and tell everybody his way to heaven. That's an actual works-based salvation. You're going to lose a full reward. You may be winning souls, but at the same time, you would be damning souls by supporting false teachers who bring in these damnable heresies. We do not want to hook up with Pentecostals. We don't want to hook up with Church of Christ or Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or any of these professing Christian groups that openly say that Jesus Christ is is not who he said he was in the scriptures or teach that works such as water baptism are necessary for salvation because those are bad, bad doctrines. To do so, if you do so, you might it might result in you losing not salvation. You're not going to lose your salvation if you're saved, but you'll lose a full reward. You can allow someone to take your crown. Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly, behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. When you get saved, you started building something. Your good works are building something to present to Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. There he's going to try every man's work of what sort it is. Even good works done with the wrong motive won't come out very good at this judgment. If you do good works with the right motive, 
then you're going to see gold and precious stones. You're going to see some rewards for what you've done. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build, see you're building something. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built their own, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So how does a person get a full reward? Live for the Lord. Do good works with the right motive. Find out what the Bible says for you to do and do it. I received another email about Matthew 20, you know, talking about the laborers in the vineyard. You know the story, every man is receiving a penny for his labor, whether he worked a long time or just for a little time. Everyone gets the same thing. Everyone's getting a penny because the laborers agreed for a penny a day. In Matthew 20 and verse 2, it says, And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So the ones who worked longer were upset because they got the same pay as the ones that only worked a little while. However, they all agreed to a penny, and it was also lawful for the householder to do what he would with his own. In Matthew 20 and verse 15, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the question had to do with, could we get practical application for the judgment seat of Christ? Because a while back I used the illustration about my pastor visiting the same man for over 25 years and trying to win him to the Lord, and I said that, if a man randomly knocks on the man's door and wins him to the Lord his first attempt, after my pastor had been witnessing to him all those years, I said I believe my pastor would get more of a reward because of the 25 years spent witnessing to the man. My point that I was really trying to make was that it isn't so much about soul winning any more than it is about soul warning. Sometimes you plant, sometimes you water, sometimes you plant a seed in the heart of a sinner, and sometimes you lead them to the Lord yourself. For example, if my pastor witnessed to people for 40 years with a heart motive for the Lord, I believe he would rack up at the judgment seat of Christ. Even if he never won somebody to the Lord, he did all that soul warning to people. And so he would get as much at the judgment seat of Christ as someone who won a thousand or more souls to the Lord. Our job is to warn the wicked. It is not our responsibility if they accept or reject it. That was really my main point in saying that. However, the question was, since of the story of Matthew 20, because of that story, wouldn't my pastor and the random soul winner receive the same reward at the judgment seat of Christ? I can't, in my mind, I can't really relate the judgment seat of Christ with Matthew 20. Although I do see what he means, and he maybe he's right in some way. I just have a hard time seeing it because they all agreed for the same pay in Matthew 20. Whereas at the judgment seat of Christ, we're not agreeing to all get the same thing. Everybody seems to be getting something different for their labor. I believe every man is going to have a reward according to his own labor. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6-8, it says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So every man will receive a reward, a reward according to his own labor. Uh, I believe my pastor in that situation would have done a lot more laboring in that certain situation, I could be way wrong. But, but it says every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. I don't believe that we're all agreeing for the same rewards. I mean, it looks like people's getting different rewards. People's getting a different amount of rewards. Some people are not getting any rewards. Also, in 1 Corinthians 3.13, it says, The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. I don't think we can nail it down how good any of us will do at the judgment seat of Christ, but we know it will be completely fair. 
Now, another way to look at it, if you want to look at it another way, consider my pastor who has been blessed with being a Christian almost 40 years. He's lived for the Lord all that time. Take, for example, another Christian who was only blessed with living one year as a Christian. If he finishes his course and lived for the Lord that one year that he was blessed with, I don't necessarily believe my pastor would get any more of a reward just because he was blessed with more years in the world. Just because he had 39 more years to live as a Christian than the other guy, I don't believe he's going to have an advantage over the person that only lived one year as a Christian. I believe the Lord's got it fixed to where, you know, he knows what he's looking for. He knows our heart. He knows all of our works that we're doing. It's going to be completely fair. In the story in Matthew 20, the laborers agreed with the householder for a penny a day. When it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord is promising a lot of different rewards and crowns and millennial inheritance depending on each individual's own work. So, maybe I'm missing something I just can't relate the two. I probably am missing something. But if a Christian will walk in the Spirit and not sell out his flesh to the devil, then he's going to get some crowns. And the crowns mentioned could all be different kinds of crowns. That's what I believe is they're different crowns. At the same time, it could all refer to the same crown. I've heard it explained that way. That each time it talks about a crown, it's really talking about the same crown, just describing it differently. For example, in 1 Corinthians 9.25, it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So here it's called the incorruptible crown that you get. And, you know, if any crown you get in heaven is going to be incorruptible. So that's why some people believe... You know, all these crowns are the same. It's just describing it in a different way. But see, this uh, crown we get is going to be incorruptible. The crowns you get, the trophies you get down here, the rewards you get down here are corruptible. They're going to burn up. And the soul winner's crown in Philippians 4.1 says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So Paul calls his converts his crown, his crown of rejoicing. But we're going to rejoice over every crown that we get. And 2 Timothy 4.8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Every crown would be a crown of righteousness. This one specifically refers to what a person would get for looking forward to the appearing of Jesus Christ. In James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Every crown would be a crown of life, but this one has to do with enduring temptation. 1 Peter 5, 4, But when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Every crown would be a crown of glory, but this has to do with the man who feeds the sheep properly and for the right motive, not for filthy lucre. Once again, you see that motive thing showing up. If you read 1 Peter 5, it shows you He's got to do it with the right motive, not being lords over them and doing it for money, specifically for money. Not saying that he couldn't get paid for preaching the gospel and teaching people, but if that's your main reason is so you can get rich or something, you've got the wrong motive. And every crown will be a crown of glory. Every crown's a crown of righteousness. Every crown will be an incorruptible crown. That's what's led many people to believe that it's all the same crown. I personally believe it's different crowns. I believe that all these are different crowns, but it, it could all be the same crown, and you can get it for different reasons, possibly. You just don't want to get to the judgment seat of Christ and not have any crowns to throw at the feet of Jesus Christ, because it says in Revelation 4, 10 through 11, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sit on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns 
before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. I don't want to get up there and not have a crown to throw at His feet. All these people who have sold out their flesh to the devil, if they don't get back on track and finish well, they won't have crowns. They won't have millennial inheritance. They won't have their garments. If you get a crown, then it is given. It's a given you'll get millennial inheritance. It says in 2 Timothy 2.12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If you sell out your flesh to the devil, then the only suffering you'll be doing is brought on by your own disobedience. But the suffering that you need to have to earn millennial reign is brought on by obedience. It's better to suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You can suffer for both because the way of a transgressor is hard. And notice the verses said, If we suffer with him, if you're suffering for the consequences of your own wicked actions, then this isn't going to get you a full reward. It is simply the consequences of selling your flesh out to the devil for the pleasures of sin for a season. The more righteous you live, the more likely you won't be found naked at the judgment seat. Revelation 19.8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. There's something about that fine linen you're going to be wearing that's connected with your, your own works today. So while we don't know everything about the judgment seat, we do know a little bit. Just a little bit. I, I just know a little bit. Another question has to do with a person who claims to be a Christian but practices witchcraft. So, is this possible? I believe the answer is yes. A, a Christian could practice witchcraft. For example, there's uh, Christians who, who maybe came out of witchcraft, they got saved, and they still got that temptation to do that stuff. I mean, just like when you, maybe you were a drunk before you were saved... And now you've got a temptation of drinking after you're saved. Maybe you had a problem with fornication before you were saved, and you still have a problem with it after you're saved. I mean, there's some things that change overnight. There's some things that it takes a lifetime to beat that thing down. However, if a person's continuing doing things like witchcraft and these pet sins... They're not living for the Lord as a Christian. They're selling their flesh to the devil to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. A person doesn't have to stay in that condition. That person can get right today. But the reason I believe it's possible a Christian could participate in witchcraft is because of Galatians chapter 5. In this chapter, Paul is talking to Christians and telling them to walk in the Spirit. And they won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. He goes on to give a list of the works of the flesh that a Christian can obviously commit. And witchcraft is one of them. In Galatians 5, 16 through 26, let's look at these lusts of the flesh. Paul says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Showing that a Christian can, and they do. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the spirit against the flesh. This is talking about a safe person. This is talking about a battle that goes on inside of a safe person. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. These are things Christians struggle with. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. There you have it. Witchcraft. A Christian can struggle with witchcraft. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. A Christian can teach heresies. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It didn't say that they wouldn't be saved. It didn't say that they would lose their salvation. 
It says they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to have inheritance when it comes to the kingdom. If we suffer with them, we shall also reign with them. If you suffer with them, you're going to inherit more cities. You're going to inherit more things in the kingdom. But there's going to be some Christians who have sold their flesh to the devil that will go into the kingdom without inheritance. They go in, they just don't have any or many cities to rule over. So that's the consequences of walking in the flesh. So Paul tells us what to do, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You want to crucify the flesh. You want to die daily. You want to reckon your flesh to be dead and live for the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So a Christian can commit horrible sins. He doesn't lose his salvation, but I don't believe he will get a full reward either. If you're going along with uh, people that are teaching damnable heresies, saying Jesus isn't God, saying water baptism is necessary for salvation, this is going to cause you to lose a full reward. If we're going to make out good at the judgment seat of Christ, the best answer I can give you for you to do is in one verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's the best answer I can find to do good at the judgment seat of Christ. If you, Whatever you do, you're doing it for the glory of God. You're going to turn out good at the judgment seat of Christ because when you wake up, you're doing what you're doing for the glory of God. Throughout the day, you're doing what you're doing for the glory of God. This is the real meaning of living life to the fullest, is doing everything for the glory of God. If you do that, what more could God ask for? So, that's my answers to these questions.